My camera bag is empty, and unfortunately, that's not on purpose. This is the Low Pro Pro Tactic bag. It is the BP450 AW2, if you want to be specific. Pretty much an upgrade of the bag I already owned. Has all the same features, bunch of pockets, access areas, places to put any kind of equipment or accessories I want on my bag. And it's just a great bag overall, but let me get into the reason why I had to get a new bag. On my first day of being in Texas after just driving for three days straight down from Massachusetts, as at a mall getting some new clothes for my new job, Houston's finest decided to take a hammer or item of their choice smash my window in while I'm in the mall, steal a bunch of bags and stuff from my car. Even though I was parked in front of a camera, I was parked next to the giant sign that said, areas under surveillance and pretty open and in like a public area. And I was just like one of those situations where if I was at a mall of a similar size back in the Northeast, probably never going to happen. Like the Natick outlets, no one's really smashing windows there, but fourth largest city in America, if there's no cop around, then it's pretty much free for all. The common theme in Houston, which I've learned is, it doesn't matter where you are in the city, you leave zero things in your car because things like this can happen. Thankfully though, two things they didn't steal was my Peak Design tripod because it was underneath a lot of the stuff I had on the ground. They probably didn't recognize what it was. And the other thing was my 100 to 400 my one lens that wasn't insured because I didn't even think to insure it in the first place because it was such an old lens that I got later. And it was just on the ground. They probably didn't recognize the case that it was in, but they made off with all my cameras, most of my lenses, my memory cards, just pretty much everything. So I've been in the process of reordering all of it. And I thought I've got most of it back already through B and H or different various websites like KEH. And I'm just gonna do a cool video, basically kind of just walking through what I got again and almost those things to think about when you're buying new equipment or used equipment or pretty much starting from scratch. So as I've kind of briefly talked about, I got the Wolfro and then the other bag I got was the Havana 48. These are two bags I had already previously owned and I've done maybe videos on. You want a quick rundown of what they are. As you kind of saw opening this up in the beginning of the video, this is your heavy duty camera bag. You can fit two cameras, multiple lenses, maybe a drone, a whole variety of camera equipment in here. So if you're going big from the start, I would definitely recommend one of these. Or if you're gonna be traveling a lot, I would recommend a more secure, sturdy backpack for your gear. If you're gonna be doing a lot of just day-to-day -day stuff, you're just kind of shooting around your home or your local city, or you're not doing like heavy duty photography trips, I recommend the Havana 48. What's great about this, it's one of those half and half backpacks, which is what I really like, so I use it for work every day. Where the top half is pretty much just your regular backpack. It's just a storage area, you got some pockets, but then the bottom half, you got a camera display area, or camera storage area, I should say. So here's your typical camera storage. You open it up. You've got some slots you can move around. I already folded one down to fit my camera a little bit better. And then this is also fully removable too. So you can use this like a regular backpack if you needed to, but it's great if you're just carrying one camera around and you need like a light sweater or a coat. And then both of these bags also come with waterproof covers. So this one's hidden in a pouch right here. And then on the low pro, it's hidden right at the bottom down here. Now to talk about the cameras and lenses that I went out and reordered. The lens and camera that you're seeing right now are not mine. I'm currently borrowing them from my department because I'm shooting sports events late on Friday nights and on weekends. I like to have two bodies on me. I should be shooting with this and showing you the camera that I got, but that's a hindsight situation and I'll just talk to you. If the cameras look basically the same, all that's different is the number next to it. The camera I ended up going with for my secondary body, because that's what came in first, is the Canon EOS R. 
and it's pretty much one of the first mirrorless cameras Canon came out with. And now you're probably wondering, why do you have the R when there's the 6, the 3, the 5, the 7, they just came out with the 10. So I went with the R to just have as my secondary body. I've got an R3 coming in the mail to serve as my primary body. And I wanted my secondary body to not be as intensive for sports as I wanted it to be. And I wanted to just make sure that like, it was still really good for landscapes. If I wanted to make videos, which the R3 perfectly can. The R is a little bit less in specs, but the price point of the R is just a little bit more affordable than getting another R5 or an R3 to have two of each. That's just overkill at that point. And compared to the other tiers, like the R6 is great for sports as well, but it just doesn't have the same photo like capabilities of the R. Even though the R6 is newer, the R still has more megapixels per photos and a lot of tests online Comparing the EOS R and the R6, even though the R6 is a little bit better for video because it does have full non-crop 4K, the R still takes better photos overall and I still do a lot of landscape shots. So if I wanted a camera where I just wanted to go out and just take pure landscape photography, which is what I really started with, and I don't want to bring along a giant R3 with me, then the R is perfect. And it's a great camera if you want to really get into more professional work you want to get more from just the Canon Rebel, but you really don't want to go full deep into a $4,000 R5. The OS R is a great, just starting entry professional, a great medium kind of, not entry level, but like a step beyond that camera. It served me well for the past two and a half years that I had it, so I thought might as well get it again. Showing you the box because the lens I'm recording with is what's on my camera. It's the 24 to 70. It's the workhorse lens of the camera world, especially for landscape photography, which is what I originally started with. It gives you a large range of focal length. 24 is wide, which is great for landscapes. 70 is narrow enough where it's really awesome for portraits. It's not going to be the best for shooting things at a range. It's really more meant for up close subjects or just wide areas in general. If you're shooting sports, this lens is going to struggle a bit just because it's not going to get the reach that you want. But if you're getting into photography and you don't know exactly what you want to do yet, this is a perfect lens to seek out. There's also a bunch of third party companies that make lenses that equip to Canon. For example, on this R5, there is a little attachment right here, which changes the EF lens to the mirrorless body, but the camera world is going more mirrorless and Canon's trying to narrow the market on its lenses. So it's trying to prevent you from being able to use third-party equipment on its cameras, which is why I did go a little bit deeper into my pocket. I got the mirrorless Canon lens. When in reality, I've been using Tamron for a while, had never really failed me with the Canon attachment, but there were a few times while I was shooting sports, and this is really only a sports specific example, where I feel like the reader and the camera wouldn't really be connected with each other well, and it wouldn't focus or work correctly. And when you need to get the exact second or moment in sports, you can't have your lens malfunction or your camera not be interacting with your lens. So that's why I went above and beyond got the Canon one. But if you're not shooting something where you need the split second, like you're just doing landscapes, you're doing post portraits, you're not really worrying about maybe missing a photo or the split second, getting a Tamron or Sigma lens, getting the Canon adapter, still works perfectly fine. So the lens that I have on this EOS R5, this is a 7-200. I've got my brand new one sitting in a box behind me, but I'm waiting for my new camera to come in before I whip it out, because I kind of want to do a cool unboxing with it. So I'm going to wait to just do those videos together. So I've been borrowing this one for now. This works great for sports, even for portraits as well. If you've got a subject that's 20 to 30 yards away from you, this is really perfect for getting a shot of them if you can't get much closer with a 24 to 70, for example. So this is great for indoor sports like volleyball, basketball, hockey, where the actual field is maybe only 30 to 50 yards wide. So that way they stay close enough to you where they're not too far away, but they're also at a distance where this lens can separate them from the background and they don't get too close to you where you can't get a good composition. So this is a great secondary lens to get if you're shooting a lot of sports. 
And then you can do some fun and creative things with it in landscape as well. Now to talk about filters, which are pretty much accessories for your camera lenses. So the first off, I want to talk about a UV filter. And this is just a fancy way of saying a screen protector for my lens. Now imagine you buy a new Apple iPhone. You're paying over $1,000 for it. If you drop it, the screen cracks, you're pretty much upset. A UV filter is pretty much the same idea for a lens where it's a thin piece of glass you screw on at the end and it keeps your lens safe if you do happen to bump into something, you drop it. It's a thin layer of glass where that layer of glass will break and not your expensive lens instead. So anytime you buy a new lens, make sure you buy a UV protector of the same opening diameter of your lens. Screw it on at the end. It's just like a headache where you pay a handful of dollars for one of these to save you thousands of dollars down the line. Another good filter to get, which is really important if you're a landscape photographer, is your polarizer. Now, it does the same thing as a pair of polarized sunglasses in a simple sense. So imagine you're out on the water or it's a bright day. You can't see much because the sun's beaming down off the water. It's super bright. You put on your sunglasses. That glare goes away. The brightness goes down. You see a lot more color. You get more blues, you get a little more saturation in what you're seeing through your sunglasses. Polarizer does the same thing through your camera lens. So this is really awesome for landscape photography, by bright areas, by water. Probably won't be using it much in sports or fast moving things because the effect of this lens has to do with the angle you are to the sun or the bright spot. So you gotta be careful while using this. Wicked mistakes often allow you seeing large dark blue chunks in your sky for no reason. That's probably because you've got your eye on a bees on the edge of your lens. Super helpful, you just gotta make sure you're cognizant of how you're using it. The third filter is an ND filter or neutral density filter for short. This also acts like a pair of sunglasses for your lens, but purely in the aspect of just making it darker. Now, why would you wanna make it darker if you could always just change your aperture or your shutter speed or your ISO? Well, a lot of times you wanna always keep your ISO low when you can, but the thing with aperture, the more open your lens is, the more shallow depth the field you get, and sometimes for video, you really wanna keep it that way. So you're gonna throw an ND filter on, which will allow you to stay at a lower aperture, but limit the amount of light coming into your camera. And then you use this a lot in photography, if you want to get blurred motion, or you want to make everything kind of go flat and smooth, especially by the water, you need a longer exposure. So you throw one of these on the edge of your camera, basically limits the amount of light coming into your camera so you can keep it open for longer and a choppy sea will become a smooth lake depending on what your exposure is. Now I'm gonna see if I can show you this in real time. So as you can see, you can see my hand through this at the moment. And as I turn this, it's gonna get darker. So now you can't see my hand through it. So that's pretty much what this does for your camera, limiting the amount of light coming into it. Next trio of items, pretty self-explanatory. You need a memory card for your camera to record your photos and video on. Then you get a card case to keep those memory cards nice and safe in your bag. And then you need to get a card reader just in case your computer or device doesn't have the right slots for your memory cards, which at this point in time, depending on if you're using Apple, Windows, PC, or whatever brand. You might have an SD card reader, but you might not have a CFS card reader if you've got the bigger, larger memory cards, or a CF reader, which is the old school ones. So you might have to invest in a reader depending on what kind of memory cards you're shooting with. Two final items I always like to have in my camera bag. The first one is a multi-tool. My favorite one of all time is the three-legged thing multi-tool. It's got a hex tool on one side and a D-ring indent thing on the other side, clips on real easily, and then this middle piece right here at the top functions as a secret bottle opener. So I always like to add this as a little attachment. I keep it in my camera bag. I keep a few smaller ones on my keychain, but these are great tools to always have on you, especially as a photographer. Now I've done a little video on different multi-tools you can purchase. Check that out because there's a huge variety out there, so pick the one that works best for you. The other thing I like to have is a lens cleaning kit. So what it is, this is from Zeiss. It's a microfiber cloth, which is super soft material. 
This helps clean up dirt and grime from your lens. And let's say it's a little greasy out, maybe you get some salt water on your camera lens if you pile the water. Having a lens cleaning solution helps because sometimes that t-shirt, that super soft sweatshirt, even though it feels really nice on your skin, might not be good enough to get the smudge off your camera. So these two together are perfect. And what's nice is this little bottle is small enough where it goes to the airport security. So if you're flying and you're traveling a lot and you're worried about losing this, you won't lose this. If you're going through security, they're not gonna take it from you. They try to, you can probably argue with them because it's under the fluid ounce requirement for liquids going through TSA. So this is great to have in your camera bag and having a spare one at home is perfect because you never really want to be, as I drop it, you never really want to be out in the field without this, getting that perfect sunset photo and you've just got spots on the end of your lens. That's gonna wrap up this video. Just a quick what you should get if you're getting a new gear video. New space, one-on-one videos will be coming at some point, but I might make a video too just based off the new area I just moved to because that's gonna be cool. Maybe I'll do a video setting up my new space because it's just a disaster right now for at least background. I just threw this quickly together just to have something to look at, but trying to figure out what kind of artwork I wanna put up behind me, what kind of artwork I wanna put in my apartment, so that'd be a fun video to make. I'm still trying to decide what prints I'm going with. We got like a blue and black theme going on in my apartment. So that's going to be fun to work around. So it's just a, a lot of stuff I want to do, but no time to do because Monday through Friday, I'm shooting photography for U of H. Plus a lot of sporting events. I'm pushing like 70 hours a week because I'm pushing myself to do that. But I'm always going to try to dedicate Sunday or a Saturday to do photography videos for you all. Sunday's hard because it's football season. So maybe come this spring, once I get more adjusted, settled in, find some cool places to go visit, check out, a more interesting content at some point. But as always, everyone, let's recap.